Coming up on Theater Talk. Was it a struggle for you to pursue yeah. an acting career? Which it, it was. My parents hated the idea, really hated it. My, my mom sent me uh, newspaper clippings about the unemployment rate in actors' <laughs> equity for <laughs> well into my 30s. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. much push. He wasn't particularly aggressive. In fact, he was a sort of a, a flop. A great big fat flop. I said stop Martha. I hope that was an empty bottle, George. <laughs> From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm producer Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. So, Michael, George and Martha have long been a subtext of this program, but tonight... <laughs> yes, indeed. Over the years, viewers have noticed that Susan and I spar like George and Martha do in Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. But our sparring is nothing compared to the sparring that's going on on Broadway right now with a superb revival of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. My favorite American play by our good friend Edward Albee and George and Martha are played by two of the finest actors I know on the stage right now. Amy Morton is playing Martha. Welcome to Theater Talk. Thank you. A brilliant performance in August Osage County on Broadway a few years ago. Thank you. Welcome back to New York. And Tracy Letts is a terrific, terrific George. He also happened to write August Osage County. And welcome. It's your first time on Theater Talk. Yes. Welcome thanks. to both of you. Thanks. Um, all right. I vividly remember the first time I read Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. I was in college, I went to the library, I had to read this play because I was going to meet this man, Edward Albee, and I picked up this play, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? I knew nothing about it, opened it up, and read the whole thing straight through, sitting in the stacks of the, of, of the library. It was that riveting. Do you remember the first time you came across this play, Amy, when you were first hit by the impact of Who's Afraid the of Virginia Woolf? The first time I came across it was the movie, uh -huh. watching it when I was a kid mm -hmm. um, at home, and my dad, who was a filmmaker, pointing out certain, he said, you know, you, you can hear the ice in the glass. Mm. That's really great filmmaking and stuff like that. So I think I was 10. Yeah. And I remember being riveted, but not understanding why these people were so mean to each other. <laughs> yes. So that was my first encounter. With yeah, yeah. And Tracy, do you remember when you first? Uh... I think also probably the movie, though, uh, my father was an English teacher, and I always remember some dog-eared paperback of Virginia Woolf sitting around the house somewhere. And so... I think uh, I used to pick it up and read it, and certainly when I became interested in acting as a teenager, it's one of the books that I used to pick up and thumb through and do scenes from uh, in the privacy of my bedroom, that sort of thing, you know. <laughs> so I've always been acquainted with the play. So an I, academic background, was your family uh, life or household a bit like uh, George and Martha's at all? No, although <laughs> my, 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 I grew up in university surroundings, and so uh, the, the, the lifestyle that George and Martha lead isn't entirely unfamiliar to me, though, though certainly uh, my, my parents were nothing like George and Martha. <laughs> Mine were. <laughs> <laughs> there, there we have it that in a nutshell. All. <laughs> um, all right, your, your, your interpretation of this uh, play has been praised for taking a slightly different tactic than we've seen before. We often have George as the real browbeaten, wimpy, taken down by Martha, and she's the, the bulldozer. The balance has shifted a little bit here. A lot of people have commented that in this production, it's George who's really in control. It's George who's so, sort of a puppet master. Do you agree with how the critics have seen your interpretation? Is it something you did deliberately? We have done nothing deliberately. We don't do things <laughs> deliberately. Um, Let's just see what happens. You know, w w Tracy and I are pretty familiar with the play because it, it, Tracy was also in a production that I directed years and years ago at the Alliance Theater. Mm. And... Um, I've always thought of this play as, if, you're, if you have to pick one person, it's George's play. Yeah. Um, he certainly is on stage the longest. Mm -hmm. um, we were very, you know, we, we've played husband and wife seven or eight times now. And so we're very familiar with each other and the way we work. And so we were, of course, f first and foremost interested in the relationship. Right. And what keeps them together rather than what's pulling them apart. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's sort of how we work on every play, I think. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, I, it wasn't a conscious decision to set out to do some sort of new interpretation by any by any stretch. Mm. Yeah, no, we we sat down on the first day and opened it up to page one and started asking those kinds of questions of Jesus H Christ, what a <laughs> <dumb>. <laughs> yeah. What are we doing here? What do we want? What are we willing to do to get at those sorts of questions? We never. We never sort of, uh, because to consider the question of doing something different is to consider what other people had done, and I don't think we ever thought too much about that. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. It's interesting, though. I've, I've always, in my interpretation of the play, I've always thought, as you say, it's George's play because I felt that they have the agreement, not to mention the child, and Martha has lost sight of the difference between what's real and what isn't, and George has to destroy her to save her, to destroy the baby to to save her and bring her back off the cliff a little bit. Is that what's going on in this uh, dynamic here? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a typical playwright. They don't want to, uh, that's not what I intend. Sure, that sounds good, Michael. Let's go with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. so, so, you, so in other words, what you're saying is that when you're acting and you're putting this play together, all of these interpretations, this overarching idea that we see in it is not what you're, what you're doing, or you're just breaking it down, breaking it down exactly. scene by you're scene, just telling, moment by moment. Telling the story. I mean, you know, um, actors and directors uh, and playwrights actually have no control over how they are perceived, how the play is perceived, and what you take away from this play has a lot to do with the baggage you brought in mm -hmm. when you sat down in your seat. So I think there are many people that see this play completely differently from each other. So um, for us, it's really important to say, stay truthful to the relationship mm -hmm. and to, um, uh, and to the, the story. But other than that, that's all, I mean, that's all we're setting out to do because whatever you take away from it is sort of out of our hands. Can Something I, wait, wait, no, 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 Mike, not, no, 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 it's an interesting question. I mean, it can, what you know, color we your... we answer these questions separately for ourselves. That's what actors do. You don't always have to have the same. Right. You don't have to agree right. on the same history. I've always considered it pretty healthy. You have. Yes. Yeah, I think so. Hmm. Okay, go ahead, Susan. You drink for the entire play. A, a remarkable. I drink. You drink. It does not. Yes. Drink. All right. But in, all right. But you are drinking for the entire play, and. Every time I've seen this show, I've wondered, is he commenting on the psychopathology of alcoholism, bringing my baggage, you know, I made a joke, but you know, that, that, that seeing people get wickedly drunk in the, at four o'clock in the morning and what happens. I always wondered with Albie if he was, was you know, bringing that to bear. Was that a subtext that this is about what happens to people when they're drunk like that? Or is it just something you don't consider? Well, it's something we consider. I mean, the the fact of the matter is that all four of these characters do a lot of drinking over the course of this night. Yeah, I mean, they're and drugged uh, beyond it, imagining. Yes, yeah. and it, it it helps explain some of the some of the extremes of the behavior and some of the the direction that the night takes. Uh, in terms of whether or not Mr. Albee is commenting upon. Uh, how alcohol is used in a relationship. I don't necessarily feel what it qualified to comment yeah. on that. I mean, certainly, certainly the indication would seem to be that Martha has a pretty serious drinking problem, <laughs> if not, in fact, all of them. And I think uh, they all do. Uh, but but then I would, then, then, then I would, no, 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 no. Then I would ask <laughs> in August, Os, in August, Osage County. Well, you know, you just don't know what I'm up against. That I have to do. Uh, <laughs> I told you it was you in August. In <laughs> August, Osage County, you have the pill popping mother who's so yeah. important. And I mean, was that something that you were considering while you were writing that character? What the, what yeah, what sure. opiates do to to a person? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, I mean. If one of the things that Edward is addressing in Virginia Woolf is uh, those uh, those defenses, those things we do in order to escape reality, right. and certainly uh, illusion is a big part uh, of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, well, 
alcohol is certainly uh, one of the doors to that escape for a lot of people. No. One has the sense that uh, you know this night is this night is only different from the other nights because they've invited people over to the house, which you get a sense that not a lot of people come over to this house. But that kind of drinking probably goes on with her most most nights. It's just now on display. But how would they do all that bed hopping if they didn't invite people over to the house? I think we've invited people over to the house. It's, there's something about this couple yeah. that is igniting this particular night and this particular brand of vitriol. <laughs> what do you think it is? Um, I don't think they're, I don't think as a couple, Honey and Nick are honest. We may be vicious, <laughs> but we're pretty truthful with each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think those two are deceitful to themselves and to each other. Okay. And I think that energy gets, uh, I think that we don't like that. <laughs> right. So They're also new. Yeah. Yeah. They're new. It's fresh meat. And you gotta, you got to initiate them into the ways of what this little town is like. So, yeah. um, Tracy, uh, when you are in this play, saying these lines night after night, as a playwright, what is it that you admire about Edward's craftsmanship here? When I'm in the play saying the lines night after Don't. night, I'm not really thinking uh, as a playwright. I mean, I'm uh, hopefully I'm I'm delivering a, a, a very challenging character, uh, uh, and I I'm just sort of focused on the job at hand. I think uh, in terms of the way that Mr. Albee's play or all of his plays informs me as a playwright. I I, I mean, any playwright who would deny the influence that he's had on them is is either unaware of it or they're lying because uh, clearly uh, his his language, his themes, uh, his sense of humor have become very much part of our uh, cultural DNA. Not just theatrical DNA, cultural DNA. I mean, he's uh, hugely influential in- Insult humor. In the American, uh, in the American culture. And so uh, Clearly, doing this play now for hundreds of performances I ha as I have, and, and being familiar with it even before then, certainly it's informed my playwriting. Though, I, I have to say, on a night-by-night -night basis, no, I'm not thinking, yeah. oh, geez, I'll be able to take this and uh, use, use some element of this in my next play. Yeah. Well, I always admired this, just the way he um, orchestrates the tension. You know, the, the scenes, the build-up, ratchet the tension, and then there's a sort of calming down <clears throat> period as he sort of switches alliances around and then builds it up again, then brings it down and then, but each time it brings it down, it doesn't go quite as far down before because the tension just keeps going up. You know, really could do a diagram of the shifting alliances in this play throughout the night. That's why he's a dramatist. That's why he's very good at being a dramatist. That's what good dramatists do. Yeah. Uh, they find a way to take their themes and their ideas and they render them in, a, in, a, in dramatic scenarios. And that's what Edward does beautifully, uh, precisely, uh, seemingly effortlessly in this play. I, I read a quote somewhere, uh, I think it was Tina Howe, who said, you, you almost get the impression from all the, for all the precision that is shown in this playwriting that he wrote the thing in about three days. It has that kind of energy in the writing in this piece. It almost feels like it was written in sort of a mad dash. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, he wrote Zoo's story uh, in, in about two or three days, actually. I remember uh, he sat, he was living in the West Village at the time, and he was, his career was going nowhere, poetry, novels, and he sat down, he'd never written a play before, and he sat down and he tossed off the Zoo story in three or four days in, in the kitchen. It does have that energy, and I don't think Who's Afraid of Virginia, Virginia Woolf took him that long to, to write up. We've talked a little bit about this. I, I, I think I think Edward and I are similar in that we we consider a play for a very long time, and then the writing, the actual writing of it, tends to happen in a very, uh, very, very quick period. Uh, I think Virginia Woolf uh, is a play that did not go through a lot of rewrites even after that initial writing process. I think pretty much what is there now. He's continued to yeah. tinker with it a bit over the years, but uh, what you see is pretty much what was always there. Right. This, the energy of this play tax your stamina as actors. You put you put so forth such incredible energy in your performances. That, and do you ever just come off stage at some moments and go, whoa? Yeah, we do every time. Every <laughs> time. It's really hard. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing easy about this. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, it's very taxing, and we get we are very tired by the end of the night. <laughs> <laughs> and two shows is cruel and unusual punishment. <laughs> <laughs> to, 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 to paraphrase um, Ethel Merman, this is a story that Elaine Stritch told us, Ethel Merman used to say, you want to be the star of a Broadway musical? You have to live like a bleeping nun. You want to be an Edward Albee play? 
You have to live like a yeah. bleeping yeah. nun. Yeah, I mean, I go home, I eat something, I sleep, I stay in bed as late as I can, as I possibly can. I get up, I eat some more, I sit around, I go to the show. Thank Ever. you for taking of your of your <laughs> precious lying around time. <laughs> All right. Come on and promote the play. And no one can talk okay. to us in the yeah. theater. Uh, it's fine revival of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf by the great Edward Albee at the Booth Theater. Two extraordinary performances by Amy Morton as Martha and Tracy Letts as George. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, Daddy knows how to run things. Well, he's a remarkable man. You bet your sweet life. Let me tell you a secret, baby. There are easier things in the world. If you happen to be teaching at a university, there are easier things than being married to the daughter of the president of that university. There are easier things in this world. It should be an extraordinary opportunity. For some men, it would be the chance of a lifetime. There are, believe me, easier things in this world. <laughs> It's exactly what art is. It's a personal vision expressed in aesthetic terms. But why do you have to have personal visions about naked women? So Michael, tonight we're going to talk about My Name is Asher Lev, which is Aaron Posner's did I say it right? Yes. Posner's wonderful adaptation. Did you say Asher right? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I want to know. It's a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful adaptation. Of those Yiddish names there. <laughs> yeah. It's a wonderful, listen to this one. It's a wonderful adaptation of Chaim Potok's <laughs> best-selling novel wow. about a young Hasidic man. That's who, how Episcopalians <laughs> pronounce it. Chaim a young, Hasidic, a young Hasidic man. I am not an Episcopalian. A uh, young Hasidic man who is... A painter, but that's a big problem when you're a young Hasidic man. Sure so is. we have with us tonight the company of My Name is Asher Lev, Ari Brand, who plays Asher Lev, Mark Nelson, who plays his father, and Jenny Bacon, who plays his mother. And you also play many other parts, right. this that's art great. dealer, the Rebbe, the other thing. So, the Rebbe? <laughs> the Rebbe. Rebbe. <laughs> the Rebbe. <That's> close enough. <laughs> We're going to use up the whole segment with you ridiculing my pronunciation. Ari, what is Asher Lev's problem? His problem is that he has a, uh, a gift and a passion for painting and drawing, and uh, that doesn't fly well with his community, with his parents. And so, Mark, why doesn't that fly? For one thing, the father is on a mission to spread Hasidism through the world. This is uh, the mid-50s. And the Jews in Russia are just beginning to be free to practice Judaism. And that's what the father wants his son to pursue. And, uh, and for another, there's no tradition of painting in Orthodox Judaism. There's no tradition of visual art. Yeah, Jenny, isn't it, isn't it blasphemy to do painting in the Hasidic tradition? I don't think it's blasphemous, Islamic, Islamic. but yeah. Thank you, Michael. Oh <laughs> well, but you're not supposed to make graven images. Graven images, yeah. I mean, I saw the play. They're all freaking out a lot. Although you, the mother, are trying to be an understanding, but you're you're very upset that he wants to be a painter. As much as it's about being an artist, it's also about um, in this culture the the spiritual expression and the sociological and the community expression are very much entwined and they cannot be disentangled and so when this uh when this expression comes out it's uh, it's it's upsetting <laughs> well i mean he's but but i think also that you're all aware the elders are aware that he this art will take him away from the community and that's right. what they have to prevent in order for their survival of their religion and their yeah their, their, their world. That's a great point, Michael, because there's a remarkable turning point in the plot when the Rebbe, based on the Lubavitcher Rebbe, yeah. uh, recognizes Asher's need and in order to keep him in the fold, arranges for him to be mentored by a great artist. Who you also play. Who I also play, Jacob Kahn, who's a bit of an apostate, a former Orthodox Jew, mm -hmm. who's been disillusioned and sees his young self in this orthodox boy who's now entering the larger world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, uh, did you grow up uh, conservative, conservative parents at all? Are you familiar with this world in, 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 your, in your real life? Well, I was bar mitzvahed in a conservative temple. I went to a reform Jewish camp for a really long time. <laughs> Already being corrupted. But, um, yeah, and then it was like, <laughs> fell away along. Uh, <laughs> um, no, but I, I, I was not raised Orthodox by any, uh, by any 
definition of the word. My, my father was. My father came from an Orthodox family. Oh, he did? Um, in Israel. Ah. Oh. Uh, did he have any particular struggles breaking away himself? He did. He did. He had a, um, well, he actually was, was, was a piano prodigy as a child. Ah. Um, he was a pianist, a concert pianist, and so um, that actually was okay with his family. Mm -hmm. um, that didn't, you know, conflict with their beliefs, or their views, or anything. They actually really uh, well. That's a bit more respectable. Him. It's more respectable than being an expressionist painter. <laughs> yes, <laughs> perhaps, perhaps. But all, but also, um, he did have a tough time sort of breaking free from. Um, the mold of orthodox. I mean, he just didn't believe that there should be so many rules and restrictions. All right. Your background, Mark, were you uh, familiar with this world uh, at all? I'm very familiar with this world, and I relate to Asher Lev. I relate to the son in the play, even though I'm playing the father. So right, that's right. an interesting predicament. And because me. your parents were uh, conservative, or your yeah, my parents. Uh, I grew up in a Jewish home in Westwood, New Jersey. My grandfather, my m mom's father, was the founder of the synagogue in Bergen County, Temple oh. Emanuel. Wow. Are you kind so, of channeling that grandfather? Y yeah, I do. Because you were the think third of him every patriarch night. in this play. Yeah. It's also an opportunity for me to understand their point of view yeah. because I have to take their point of view to, yes. to yes. play it. But when I was 16 years old, the book was published, My Name is Asher Lev, mm -hmm. and I had already read The Chosen and loved it. Right. And I remember feeling it was hot in my hands mm -hmm. sitting in the backyard because uh, it validated this young artist to follow his own voice despite everything that his family and tradition were telling him and that was what I needed to hear at that time. Did, was it a struggle for you to pursue yeah. an acting career? Which it, it was. My parents hated the idea, really hated it. My, my mom sent me uh, newspaper clippings about the unemployment rate in actors' <laughs> equity for <laughs> well into my 30s. <laughs> the, but then uh, I was in some plays by Neil Simon on Broadway, and my yeah. parents came to see it and met Neil Simon in the dressing room. Oh, was oh. forgiven. Big fans. <laughs> my father, I had never seen this in my life. He turned beet red from head to toe. <laughs> Pleased to meet you, Mr. Oh, Simon. Cool. And from that moment on, I was cool with my family. It was all right. That, what now, about you, Jenny? Jenny Bacon. Oh, well, yeah, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I was raised a godless heathen. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't have any of these but, issues that these yeah. guys have. But I, no, but I do, because I was raised by psychologists. So it amounts oh. to pretty much the same thing. Right. You feel a lot of pressure, a lot of judgment. Mm -hmm. You guys mentioned uh, Neil Simon, uh, who really, um, in many ways, uh, brought the Jewish culture of the 30s, the 20s and 30s, he grew up into the, into the mainstream of our culture yeah. through those f fantastically successful plays. Yeah. Now, you were in the original um, Biloxi Blues and Brighton Beach Memoirs as well, did you do And those? Broadway Bound and Rumors for Neil Simon. Did plays. Four Neil Simon yeah. plays. And you were supposed to be in the uh, uh, Neil Simon Broadway plays, the revival a few years ago of uh, Biloxi Blues and Broadway Bound. Brighton Beach Memoirs and Broadway. Your Broadway, Broadway debut. Yeah. Yeah. My debut. But it got <laughs> scotched <laughs> because Brighton Beach Memoirs only ran a week or so and they never opened Broadway Bound. How That's good right. was that Broadway Bound? I always heard it in rehearsal was quite good. <laughs> Broadway Bound was yeah. going to be, yeah, it was going to be wonderful. I mean, it was basically the same cast as the Brighton Beach Memoirs, which a lot of people saw and it was well received. Mm -hmm. um, but they just uh, weren't selling tickets. Yeah. So the thing just kind of collapsed. It was a pretty pretty tough moment. Um, <laughs> okay. Lasted probably about a month and then <laughs> I finally walked out of the house. You know, now when you started working on this play with Gordon Edelstein, mm -hmm. what, how did he sort of start you out? What, what did he <clears throat> charge you with to begin, Ari? Well, you know, we took a, a tour oh, of Crown so Heights oh, um, awesome. of the community where Asherlev reportedly, you know, is born and raised. It's the Lubavitch community in Crown Heights. So we went to, uh, you know, the, sh the synagogue and we went to the headquarters of the Lubavitch movement and we got a whole tour by this man who gives tours of, of the community. We saw a mikvah, um, yeah, a mikvah and a matzah like factory. A, little, little a matzah factory. And, um, and that was an amazing, amazing experience. Um, to and a, a, a Torah scribe, a man sitting with um, calf skin, you know, parchment, and dipping his quill into an inkwell and writing letter by letter uh, through the whole Torah to to, takes him two years to complete. It, it comes across in this play as a very 
suffocating community. <coughs> but then let me quickly a add Because you're anti-religious. No, not at all. But the great, well, I'm anti-fundamentalist, but we're not talking about me. No. But the thing is, but then at the end of the play, you're very mixed. You don't right away say, ah, oh, this kid had to get out of there. You, 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 you have, that's, it, it really is thought uh, provoking about is he doing the right thing or is he, you know, abandoning these people? Yeah, like many things, it's a lot more complicated than, Absolutely. you know, he just rejects his faith yes. and goes to his art. Yes. That's not what the story is about. The story is about the struggle. Yeah. And it's about how he can sort of, you know, manage his life. He wants to remain a religious Jew. He wants to remain observant. And at the same time, so many things are telling him and, and that he can't. Um, if he wants to do the yeah. thing that he needs to do, which is to paint. Yeah, well, that's called conflict, and that's, that's drama. Well, right. wonderful for performances by Jenny Bacon, Ari Brand, and Mark Nelson. Thank you. My name is Asher Lev at the West Side Theater, directed by Gordon Edelman. And it's based on a novel by whom? Chaim Pota. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're converted. You. And happy Hanukkah. <laughs> happy Hanukkah. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> happy Hanukkah. This is our Hanukkah show, folks. <laughs> Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night. <laughs>